Okay, this is Defensive Programming 101. My name is Niall Berrigan, and I will be your host on the Stupidity Channel today. If you are tweeting, please use go to our and at Merrigan, that's me. First off, I'm Irish. I'm very Irish. I live in Norway. Whoops, this is not working. Hello? There we go. Um, I'm Irish. <laughs> no, seriously, we've done that. And I live in Norway. Come on, there we go. And I have lived there for the last seven years. My Danish is crap, but my Norwegian is good. Um, I work with Capgemini in Stavanger as the head of custom software development there. I'm an ASP.NET MVP, maybe not today anyway, or more, because today's my, uh, where we find out whether I'm still good or not. And I do a little bit of work with Redgate. So, I have to move on a little forward because I can't see everyone. How many of you are developers? Okay, how many of you are not developers? Why are you here? <laughs> Sorry, it's a joke. Uh, okay, uh, for those of you playing the home game at home uh, and the recordings thing, um, nearly everyone put their hand as being developers. So that's a good thing, right? Now, why don't developers write secure code? Anyone willing to shout? Yes, sir. We're lazy and we don't have the budget for it. Come see me afterwards. I'm giving you an Xbox 360 subscription for a year. Well, that's exactly it. Um, yes, I reward people who interact with me, it's very handy, it's called bribery in my country. Um, our politicians are very good at it. Um, we, as programmers, don't, like, don't write secure code because generally we're lazy, that's one thing. Maybe, maybe not always, I'd like to think that you guys are actually quite good at what you do. Generally it's because it's hard, but mostly because we are a very trusting bunch. I've written this code, it's my child, why would I want to break it? You know, go out there, son, and play with the cars on the little white line. <laughs> if you come back in, you can be like Sparta. You know, the Spartans, they, that's exactly what we have to think of our code sometimes. We don't write secure code because, yes, it's very difficult to write. Um, it takes time, we don't have the money. Sometimes a guy in marketing or sales will come in and go, hey, Niall, um, I got a new job. Say, yeah, what is it? We need a CMS written. Cool. When do you want to buy? Four hours. Okay, I'll, do you want a security with that? Yes, no. We're not getting that. We write code for these lovely people, our nice users. They're very happy, as you can see. <laughs> That's because later on in life, she will discover that perms have gone out of style. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the little, uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, it does. The little kid here is doing. So. <laughs> now, users, as we like to say, if you say go A, B, C, they will go A, B, C. They won't ask why there's a B. They will just do it. We make money from these people. Be nice to them, right? I know it's a very difficult concept for most developers. Fucking users. Sorry, as, an, as can we bleep that out? As an Irish person, I find it very hard not to swear. Um, for the American, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're very, in, by the way, sorry your country shut down. <laughs> Thank God there was a yank in the room to do that for. I'd be like, oh, I really wish there is one. <laughs> Democracy. <laughs> Healthcare. Uh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> before I get myself into an international incident. Hackers and bye. Uh, he's a posh hacker. He's using a tie. Um, <laughs> right. How many of you, if I asked you today to turn off the mouse on your computer, would go, oh boy, I can't use my stuff. Why are you here? <laughs> One guy. You're brave enough to say, okay, that's cool. Uh, learn to use keyboard shortcuts. They're awesome. It's, it's quicker than using copy-paste by clicking um, for your coding. Uh, hackers, crackers, advanced users, all the same, really. Because they are going to look at your code and go, A, B, C, why the hell do I need B? If you put them on a plane with a button that says, do not press this button, plane's wings will fall off. Repeatedly. By the way, never tell kids that, that you know, that's the seat thing. It freaks the hell out of them. <laughs> yes, I'm a parent. I'm telling my kid that as well. Stop it. <laughs> anyway, 
We write code to defend against this. If you saw Aaron's talk, he was doing about the outsides of things and telling you how to prevent against this. Mine is about the internal bits. These are the kind of the people we have to try and uh, go against. They're very crafty. Very nice people, honest. Um, sometimes they're just a person. Sometimes they're an entire nation state. So you kind of have to think a bit crafty. You kind of have to kind of, as the Norwegians say, what would the fox say? Um, I don't really know. Um, they, the thing with this is that as we get smarter, they get smarter. For every single thing we think will block them, they design something new. Apple, with their new little thumbprint scanner, a gummy bear. You know, it comes down to what type of attack vector are we going to look at next? Who thought it would, you could actually hack an iPhone through the electricity channel? How many of you have seen Rubber Ducky? Do you know what it is from Hack 5? Rubber Ducky is a USB pen, USB stick, that you plug in and it registers to Windows as a keyboard, but executes script. And someone will go, why would you do that? Because you didn't say I couldn't. <laughs> Remember, this is like dealing with children. Don't do that. Why? Because I said so. <laughs> so, what do we do? We fix our developers. And not the same way you fix your pets. It, yeah, there's one person who got it. Well done. <laughs> We're talking about education. Because the web is an absolutely terrifying place. We forget sometimes that we're not all nice people. Some people are going to break our things. They're going to try and really get aggressive with our stuff. And what this talk is about is showing you the stupid stuff. Now, this is the, probably the fifth year I've done this talk. Uh, not here, but in general in Europe. And it's probably the last time I'm going to do it in Europe. And in five years, I have had never had anyone come up to me and said, we had zero mistakes out of your talk. OK? I'm hoping that this really big room will provide a cool clean sheet for me, and I will actually get away with, after five years of presenting this talk, with no one with zero. This is a kind of a collection of the OS top 10 done my way. It shows you some stupid stuff. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. It'll make you go, what the hell were they thinking when they decided to do that? OK? Please. What your main takeaway from this session should be is go look at your applications afterwards, reevaluate what you're doing, maybe kind of challenge the gifted wisdom inside there in your app and say, why are we doing it this way? Is there a better way? Has it been circumvented since we decided to put it in? So number 10, I will ask you a lot of questions. I will hopefully try and get feedback from you. I was explaining to Aaron that like uh, Nordic countries give you very little feedback. You get the little golf clap. Well done. That was a good session. And that's about it. Thank you for laughing, by the way. You'll all be bribed later. Um, <laughs> we've spiked your beer. Number 10. Oh, yeah. It involves leaving administrative info on your web server. Now, we'll ask a few questions. How many of you have deployed a web application to the world, the internet thing, big place. How many of you have rang your friends and said, I've done it? One person, and that's, you're a security guy, so that doesn't really matter. The rest of you all put your hands down. Why? We can do this all day, folks. <laughs> Generally, I think it comes down to, I am not telling anyone I put my stuff out there. They'll bloody break it. Yeah, by the general, <laughs> yeah, that's what you've done, isn't it? <laughs> Most of us do that. We don't want to tell people we put stuff out there because they'll try and break it. I will. But I'm an asshole sometimes, so it's like it's my job. Um, how many of you have done, like, for example, the trick of like, I'll back up the site, I'll zip it, and I'll leave it in the directory? I'll put my hand up. I've done that. How many of you tried Googling that afterwards? Let's have, oh, I'm, I'm, I should have plugged into the Wi-Fi here, but I'm, I'll show you something in a minute. The thing we do is sometimes we forget that we leave application info on the server, and we just forget that it can actually be Googled or done. Uh, we'll go back and take the piss out of the American again. Do you remember this thing called the White House? 
If we forward, shut down. Cool. Um, and do you remember this guy called Bush? Yeah. The, the, I was going to say the smarter one, but no. Uh, <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. The one W. <laughs> Do you remember the robots.txt from there? <laughs> if you've never seen it, go Google uh, oldwhitehouse.gov uh, robots.txt. Robots.txt, if you're not familiar with it, is it tells search engines where not to search. This told them, it was like, it was basically like, here's the map to Area 51. Yoink, don't search here. <laughs> not, nothing to see here, folks. Just carry along. W. Um, it was. It was. I was thinking the webmaster was like an webmaster that day. It was. They just did not get it. Um, and when it was found, it went really, really viral very quickly because it proved something very simple: that even very smart people can make stupid mistakes by leaving that type of information out there. Um, we're going to see if this works, and if it does, great. And if it doesn't, oh well. Uh, the internet. Where is that? Yes. Can we can't see that? Can we? No. We're going to try and do something here. All right. If I look at this, yep. you can see file type config in URL, web.config in URL FTP. Now, there's a couple of people trying to figure out what I've just shown them. But what I've just shown you is someone who's left an FTP server site open with access to the web.config. And then for those of you who are familiar with ASP.NET, web.config is how you configure your application. All right? Now, I had a look at this last night because I'm, of course, nosy about it all. and if we go a little bit further down here, we see applications.mercedesbenz.co.za. That's the South African Mercedes-Benz trainers. Inside there, I, I don't really want to show this on a public forum. I'll let you Google it yourself. Um, they sh it's inside the web config, complete with uh, connection strings to the database. Ladies and gentlemen, go buy yourself a Merck. <laughs> You can Google any amount of information. It is a really powerful tool, provided you start using advanced queries and actually going looking for stuff. Now, some of you are going, why would you leave FTP open? Well, I want to FTP stuff up and down. It's a easier, and I kind of want to do it. It's, you know, I don't have access to HTTP, or I can't map the drives, or I'm not using Web Publish, or I'm not using Web Deploy, or whatever. OK. Leaving that type of information open, very stupid, can happen. I've seen the IIS start page. I've seen like the admin scripts. I've seen people where they've enabled it so they can be run from remote servers. Because it's easy, don't, it doesn't mean you have to do it. Okay? Sometimes it is come down to don't leave your admin. This is a very difficult one for web, for, uh, web folk because we're so used to the application, we forget on the server we're running. Sometimes we'll forget it, and then it'll go unnoticed until someone kind of breaks in and does something with it. You know, watch that one. Number nine, passwords. This gets me a lot because I hate it when I forget my password. How many of you do that? How many forget passwords? Cool. How many of you use the same password for Gmail, Hotmail, Female, Baseball, something? I have no idea. Facebook. How many of you change them regularly? Now, there's probably there's one person now just getting a really tired arm. <laughs> we don't do it because we're human. Passwords are hard. We make one complex one, and we kind of use it for everything. We make a simple one, which is kind of like a throwaway one. We can use things like LastPass, KeyPass, whatever you want. They'll all do the same thing. But we still, in general, forget that passwords are kind of ours, and we just kind of throw them out. More often than not, you'll use the same password on multiple sites attached to your email. Now, all it takes is one compromised server and one compromised database to get that email and password combination. How many of you have kind of seen, like, when I forgot my password, I'll email it back to me, and it comes back in plain text? How many of you hate that? How many of you want to go back and shoot the developer? <laughs> There's a lot of blood in this audience. <laughs> ah, the Vikings are back. <laughs> you know what? It would be great if we could actually leave a, a really bad developer's head on a pike outside the door. You be stupid, this is what happens. You know? I think you used to do that to the Irish. I don't know. Err. Passwords, in general, cause us a lot of problems. It's very easy to forget to encrypt them, OK? Hash them, whatever. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be very specific here. Hash the passwords, don't encrypt. Encrypt is reversible, hashing is not. 
Okay, get that into there. All kind of sensitive data should be in, should be hashed. Um, the basic ASP.NES provider uses SHA-1. Replace it, use something like bcrypt. Use a SHA-256. It's a quick NuGet install, off you go, good luck, and you're done. You've changed the provider. You've now got really strong encryption on your uh, or, uh, hashing on your provider. You can do a lot more stuff with it. The idea is this. We, passwords are now becoming the kind of standard issue kind of security gateway. Um, how many of you use two-factor authentication with like Twitter or Gmail or anything like that? Uh, maybe you should start investigating on that. Just those who don't use it, just do it. It's a very simple trick. It's annoying, but it does work. It's kind of, this is the problem, the trade-off between, what the? Ah. Um, the trade-off between uh, security and kind of usability. Number eight is probably where we get the most caught. And number eight is not patching our server or allowing our admins to do it for us. What happens the second Tuesday of every month? Well done. No, better known as Patch Tuesday. What happens the Wednesday after the second Tuesday of every month? It's called Rollback Wednesday. <laughs> not zero-day hacks, but close enough. It's like, oh, crap, it broke something. Yoink. How, more often than not, what you'll find is the administrators will patch about a month after the update comes, about, uh, comes out, mainly because they need to check it. It never happens that you kind of go, oh, we'll just roll in this, on this crucial server. We'll update it and see what happens. We'll do it on the test box, and we'll do everything. You have a question? Or are you just waving at me? Oh, you do that. Yeah. You're honest. Yeah, because like we, I used to work with SharePoint. <sighs> I still get in the shower, and it just doesn't come off. Um, feel sad for me. Come on. <laughs> Those of you who are working with SharePoint are going, oh, yeah, man, I was there, I've been through it. Um, SharePoint had a very common thing. When you would apply an update, it would generally break something. The user profile service would break. Something would break. You had to fix it. It just, it was hell. So no, no one ever patched it on the day because they had to wait and test everything out. Same problem happens here. People don't patch servers because of the fact that they don't know what's going to happen. They need to figure out if it's going to break. They want to try and see what happens. It's very, very cautious and stuff like that. Microsoft had the Oracle padding with ASP.NET and stuff like that. That came out very quickly because it was a QFE release, uh, Quick Six Engineering. It had to be done because it if it didn't, it broke so much other products that just needed to be fixed. That was one of those ones where you kind of said, uh, yeah, we'll screw the results. If it breaks, it breaks, but at least we won't be compromised. Generally, as web developers, as web application developers, whatever, we are not overly concerned with the deployment platform. We, we kind of know it has to be this, but we don't really kind of check the state of patches on it. You can Google for machines uh, that are not patched. You kind of have to put in, like, for example, try and throw a, an error message and see if you can get the correct ASP.NET version number from it. You know, it's very simple. IIS 6 running ASP.NET 2.0, for example, and you can probably kind of guess that they haven't patched this box in a while. Very simple, looking for kind of um, uh, header information off servers. Now, the funny thing is, if you go looking at, like, is this, is it SurveyMonkey? Um, there's, their header information comes back with, like, you know, um, uh, powered by bananas and rum. Um, Marvel's is, like, running on Wolverine or Cyclops or something like that. I can't remember what of them does have a drop tables in it, in the header thing. So watch out for that. That's kind of fun. Let's see what we're doing. Number seven. I'm running through this a little bit. I'll slow down in a minute. Um, number seven is authentication. Quick show of hands again. Ready? How many of you turned off JavaScript on your browser and browsed the web? How many of you thought it was sucked? <laughs> JavaScript is the standard for kind of scripting and stuff like that. It's also the standard for writing um, authentication routines. The problem is that if you turn off JavaScript, and you don't have uh, server uh, validation turned on or anything like that, all of a sudden, your gates are open. Sorry, we're going to take the bouncers away for a while just so they can have a smoke and a cup of coffee. You guys be good and show your ID when you're going in, right? Yoink, all through. The problem is that you should have double, double auth or was it uh, double factor authentication, normally auth authenticate. Uh, uh. 
I'll get with the program Irishman. Um, Two-factor validation on the client and on the server. If it's going to go to your database, if it's going to go to your file system, it's going to go anywhere, your server should validate it and reject it if it's not right. You should use a central validation source for everything. Main reason is, if they tomorrow decide they're going to change how email works and change how mail addresses are going to be formatted, you only have to change one place, not everywhere. You won't, miss a mistake. You won't make a mistake. Validate against the RFC rules. Validate XML against the DOM against uh, and uh, what's that thing called again? XML. Um, I can barely spell it. Um, you should also look at when you're doing your validation and stuff like that that people can't bypass it. You know, very strict kind of do it like that. I have seen the kind of SQL injection uh, script where the person has a JavaScript on and it says if you find the word select. Ignore it, or if you start putting in kind of funky characters, it all does that. Um, we then turned off the JavaScript, and of course, then we could do SQL injection on his server. But you've got to be very careful. JavaScript is the way we work with this stuff. It's very simple to make a mistake with it. You can do two side validation um, and things like that. But please, you know, make sure your server validates it at least. There's an, there's a, an Irish joke of like, why does an Irishman wear two condoms? To be sure, to be sure. And it's very true in this case. With um, you want to be doubly sure nothing gets through. Number six, we have our nice little thing. Have you all gone to sleep? Everyone awake? In general, <laughs> I had to find the IKEA thing because this is a Swedish error. You actually had to put this together yourself. It came with a manual. The problem with error messages. Um, how many of you see a stack trace? And it's for the ASP.NET guys now. Um, how many of you who see a stack trace can read it? Good. There's a, is there anyone who didn't put up their hand in ASP.NET Developer? Nope. OK, we're OK. Um, just because it looks all funky and stuff like that does not mean I cannot read it. This has come from in Media Inc., something like that, index.html. It tells me a lot of information straight away. For those of you who can't read it, it says, could not find file, C clients, IMA, IMA, app data, breadcrumb.xsl. Can, the amount of information you can get from this is absolutely stupid. It gives you a very simple idea of what they're doing. You also can tell a couple of other things. One, they haven't turned custom errors on. OK? Number two, they, you, they haven't turned custom errors on. So that means you can probably start looking at other attack vectors very quickly. It is, I found this on the Irish Examiner website, or something like this, and it was written in vb.net. And I thought, OK, there's my first mistake. Uh, number two, this thing comes up, and I'm like, oh god. I emailed the webmaster and said, listen, you're doing this wrong. By the way, there's a bug in your code here. <laughs> Here's my bill. <laughs> Consulting. Screwing people out of money all the time. I mean, uh, we're being good. Uh, the main issue with this. And it's very simple to actually fix this type of error, is turn remote errors only. So allowing that you, when you're on locally working in dev, you'll see the errors. But when it gets pushed to production, it automatically gets set to this. Now, if you've not seen a thing called Slow Cheetah, it's uh, XSL, uh, uh, the app web config and XML transforms. Um, it's a tool written by Sahid Hashimi in Microsoft as part of the web deploy team. He has written this thing, which allows you to basically say, OK, I want to, when it gets deployed to production, change all the following values. It's very simple. It makes it very easy so that when you push it out to production, you can be guaranteed it's going out with the correct settings. You don't have to remember. It's just, just work. The tools are there. Just use them. You shouldn't also leave trace.axd on. How many of you have ever tried to look for that on an application? I've actually went looking for it. And then those who kind of they appear, it's Gives you a good indication of what's actually going on. Um, Elma.axt. Any familiar with Elma? Logging system. If you, if you incorrectly configure it and kind of leave it a little bit open, it does show you a hell of a lot of amount of data. It absolutely is horrendous what it did. It just says, yeah, here you go. I'm going to tell you everything. Shh. Good luck. Go, f go break stuff. Glimpse.axt. Have you seen Glimpse, the product from the guys uh, working with Redgate? Not seeing Glimpse? Please go check out uh, getglimpse.org. Um, it's a firebug for your application uh, in the browser. And 
if it natively it's, it's quite secure. But if you do say, for example, I want to see what's happening, why is something slow, and you're a consultant, you log in, you just change it so it's visible to everyone else, it will show you things like the, for example, the connection string. So be very careful when you kind of turn your debug off, turn uh, remote errors on minimum, um, but you should have custom errors on. Number five, permissions. This, I think, is probably the trickiest part in the kind of 2010 plus era of Windows development. Most developers from the 90s and around that area were familiar with how NTLM worked and understood how Windows authentication worked and its interaction between IIS and Windows itself. Because in that stage, you kind of had to understand how Windows authentication did work. For example, do you, have you ever gone into a client or a customer or have you ever set up an application whereby you have Windows authentication working against the database? You log in, it works. You publish a deployment, and it says it can't log in with network service. Anyone done that? You, sir, do you know how you fixed it? You remember the error message. The general way that a lot of people fix it, believe it or not, is they add the net computer name to the database server and let it run that way. This is what's known as the old double hop authentication problem. And it's because of the way Windows doesn't allow you to pass credentials without using a thing called Kerberos, or what's known as delegation of rights. This is where most developers and web developers will go, Poof. I don't know what happened. It broke. It worked on my machine, nice big star. It published in production, doesn't work. You'll see things like they'll move the database to the same server. They'll move something around. They'll have to try and figure out what's going on. The general fix is that's what they'll do. And you're going, oh, did you not understand what went wrong? No, but this is how I fixed it. Um, back in the good old days before OpenXML and all that kind of thing, if you wanted to do like uh, creating Excel files on the server, you normally installed Excel on the server, and then you gave it domain administrator rights to the box. I have actually seen the ASP.NET worker process with enterprise admin rights in a domain. Now, the people who are laughing are now understanding what I'm asking. Those of you who are not laughing, it's equivalent of saying, here's a headless rodent running around our business with full rights to just pay anything and do anything. It doesn't matter. It can do anything it wants. And that password and stuff can be hacked. Have you guys seen how to hack the IIS metabase? Anyone know what IIS is? I have to ask these questions. I've got the very much the Danes going, I'm OK. Were you all out drinking last night? Without me? The IIS 6 uh, compatibility stores uh, means that I can go inside and actually query the metabase and actually get the SAM username and SAM password out of it, which means, which I've actually done before on IIS. I'll, you can just use a straight query. You can actually get that information back out. It'll give you the username and password in plain text. So it was actually how I recovered domain admin password one day, because someone <laughs> we forgot it. Um, this type of information out there and permissionings makes it a problem. The, the normal question I ask is, how many of you use like two connection strings for your application, one for read and one for write? The uh, shifty eye look here is, means that very few people have done it. One gentleman I can see there. Why does search need write permissions? And so the question I'm going to ask you is because as you're looking at defining permissions, very specific permissions for a very specific job, don't give it any more than it needs. Start from the ground up and then reduce, or sorry, and then add as you need. Never go from the top and reduce, because what happens there is people go, oh, it's still working, it's still working, it's still working, it's still working, it's broke. Ah, I've got to go back up one, and it might be too much. Fine grain permissions, do it like that. You should be using like a two connection string process if you're using one, one for search, one for read, and one for write, DB, DB reader, DB writer. Take away permissions you don't need. Evaluate actually in your application, do I need to run it as this specific user, or can I kind of work as something else? We're all thinking, we sh as, you, as you're sitting here, you should all start to be kind of thinking about your applications and going, yeah, maybe. Um, I had something like this before where I, had, I was doing this in, I think, one of the first times I ever did it was in, um, in Scotland. I had a gentleman sitting in front of me, and I said, how many of you use, uh, give permissions like this? And then and he goes, says, I have SA running on my connection string. 
And I went, right. I said, what's your site? And he goes, www. And I was like, <laughs> we're about to see if we could do an SQL injection attack. Because at SA level, I'm going to show you something later with an SQL injection attack and how much actual information you can get out. And it's frightening. Because I was trying to figure out, why would you need SA, or system administrator level permissions on a database, to do a simple query? There's nothing that you should need SA for. Thank you. Yes, it is ignorance about how to set up SQL Server. The problem is, like as we say, developers will go, it works. Don't touch it. You know? How many of you have actually done that, where it goes, it works, and then leave the testing to someone else? People like me. <laughs> we, as developers, need to be more conscious of these type of problems. Right. We're starting to get into the fun bits. I'm going to do some demo work now. Have you heard of directory traversal? Anyone? One person there? Two, three, four. Directory traversal is where you can access up and down uh, where you shouldn't go. For example, um, we, the basic example is directory browsing is enabled, and you kind of go bouncing around, and it doesn't show you anything. But consider the following. The web.config cannot be downloaded from an application, correct? Sorry? If you have directory access, it still won't allow it, um, because IIS will block, because it's a blocked file type. But let's see if this works. Come on, kiddo. Is this it? Yeah, OK. I'm sorry, I have to kind of search around a bit uh, here, and we'll see if this works. And this might go somewhere. Hello. Oh, boy. Come on, demos. Uh, Hello? Right, that's there. Jesus, I'm really, do you know what? As a developer, I'm really complicated, screens are complicated to me. Uh, okay, this is just gonna have to go somewhere here. Is that the right one? Yes. Can we debug this, please? F5, are you running? Oops. There we go. All right, um, I'm going to just uh, enhance this a bit. Can everyone see that in the back, even those up in the nosebleed seats? OK, this is a very simple site. I call this project Swiss Cheese. It's the most secure site in the world, as you can see running over HTTP. Um, this is a very simple site. This kind of demos some functionality that we would, in general, have in an application. So I have upload a file. I'm going to choose a file. It's called badstuff.aspx. I'm going to show and save and show. It should show as an image, but it's not because it's not an image. Open image in new tab. Ooh. What's that? That, my dear friends, is badstuff.aspx. <laughs> this is a, just a simple file browser written as a, single, as a single page. And what it allows me to do is bypass fairly much everything I want to do. So I want to download web.config. We'll open that. We'll see what version of something it Oh, there it is. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, where would this? Ooh. Web.config downloaded. Now, I don't know about you, but it tells me a lot of stuff. I see a machine key. I see membership providers. I see connection strings. I see everything. This, I know this is a very trivial example. What this actually is doing is someone has allowed an upload and not checked what type of files they're going to upload. I uploaded a file, found out where it was going to be put, and then just said, right, let's do this. It's a stupid example. But as OneFlow says, why would you do that? Because no one said I couldn't. Now. Right. As you can see, what I, if I had written that code a little better, I'll show you what a code actually looks like. Um, if I can move my mouse a bit. And we will show this with this one. There we go. And this is complicated doing it like this. This must be what pair programming is like. <laughs> Someone stop moving my mouse. 
Okay, we're just going to stop that. I look so stupid right now. <laughs> uh, do I have bad stuff? I'll open it. Uh, open. Oh. Hang on a sec. I'm going to do something stupid here. And we're going to put this over here so I can actually use it on this. No, that's wrong. Bear with me for a sec while I try and make a bad situation worse. Um, demos, uploads, bad stuff. .aspx, run back over here. There we go. OK. <coughs> when you load the page, just as a quick look for what current application path I'm in, it checks, gets a list of all the files, search option, all directories, just gets all the old directories all below this, binds the files, and turns out a, binds out a repeater. Something stupid. Number two for the download, which is the most interesting part, is it just gets the thing and just sends file read all bytes and then just output streams it. So it bypasses the IIS filters and just sends it through ASP.NET. This is a common thing when you want to try and uh, force a file download. If you want, for example, not display a text file, but actually get them to download it, download the PDF, download something where it would normally natively open in a browser, this is a common scenario. People will actually use this. In, what, in my case, what's made the difference is I've told it, ignore all that and just kind of just download the files however I want. I don't care. I'm whatever link I click on, download it. Now, it's a stupid example, but to some people, it's probably a revelation that you can actually do this type of thing. And when I showed this one the first times, I had a person actually say, we do this. And I said, do you actually tell what file to do it? He says, yes, in the, in the URL. And I said, oh, boy. Because it worked. And at that point, the problem was solved. And the person thought, next problem. And did not consider what would happen if someone went and did this. Now. <coughs> It's a, as I say, stupid example. Someone probably wouldn't allow a file upload of an ASPX file, but in this case, they do. But if you do allow all multiple file uploads or types of things, do you actually check what files you're uploading? And this kind of idea of like being able to kind of go up. Now, let's extend this one more. And say I am running this application as a very privileged user, something that has access to root C or beyond. And I go into C, Winder, System32, drivers are someplace around there. And I go looking for the SAM and security databases. Does anyone know what I've just found? Anyone heard of off? Yes, sir. You did. You just found all the accounts. And if I gave you those two pieces of information, could you break them? It's a question. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to wait here. But you have the machine key. If you've got information, use off crack, brute force. One GPU, and you're kind of going through all this. There is a thing called Radeon City. If you've not heard of it, go look it up. It is a 25 GPU cluster running Radeon uh, graphics processors. It currently processes a. Uh, 186 billion passwords a minute. Now, for those of you doing the maths and the guys at home with the calculator, that's about maybe you know, 25 passwords per person per minute. I don't have 25 passwords. Even that many combinations, this thing is just chunking out stuff. It can crack nearly every known password in Windows in about six hours just by brute force and a small nuclear reactor going beside it. And given that you can probably buy a nuclear reactor, because we'll sell it, we'll buy it from you to provide money. I've got 10 minutes, is it? Sweet. Um, yeah, actually, anyone want to buy a nuclear reactor from the Yank, they'll probably put them back in business. Um, <coughs> OK, no more jokes at you, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, where are we at? That's number four. That's our demo, number three. Um, SQL injection, no, it's actually XSS injections. Injection attacks are still very prevalent, even in this day and age. OK? It's stupid. We, we, we should be kind of getting better at this information and better at this stuff, but we're not. We're actually getting worse because people are kind of going, ah, yeah, it'll be fine. Everyone else is doing it that way, so why should we worry? The amount of times you get caught with this. Script injection, there's three different types. There's the DOM, which is very common. 
There's non-persistent, less common, and persistent, which is the least common but the most dangerous. It's the one where you just type in something and you expect to get script back and it does all that. Now, I've seen people say, OK, we'll use, SQ we'll use scripts and try and avoid this. Uh, we'll use JavaScript and try to uh, get this working out and avoid this. But then you can start putting stuff in in HTML characters, format especially, whatever. It starts getting, there's the attack vectors out there, and there's like, there's tools written for this. They just kind of go off and scan your site, as you pointed out earlier on. Um, there's tools written for this which will actually just kind of start hitting your site with every type of crap it can imagine and give you back a report saying, yeah, they're probably susceptible to the following. Go try it. It's very simple and cheap. Now, as cookies, we, with the EU and the cookie directive and a whole lot of things like that, does not really sound like a dodgy 80s band, the cookie directive. Oh, come on, someone give me a laugh for that. Jesus. Uh, there's a simply laugh. See, that's what you do. You ask them. Sorry. Um, you have, do you, not, do you know what the, uh, was it, the um, ASP.NET Web for, uh, uh, Forms Authentication, that in general, if they're on the same server, they'll use the same cookie type? And if you kind of don't have the correct name on it, it'll actually use the same one to kind of get stuff stored together, and it's a bit odd. So be very careful about your cookies. Your cookies should only be accessible to server-side code, never accessible to client-side. And your HTTP cookies should only be set to HTTP only cookies equals true. Don't use session cookies on the browser. Um, take it from a person who did send out a link to a new site with a full administrator session cookie in the URL. And it was a government site. Contracting, yeah. <laughs> Causing problems. Session hijacking is very, very simple. It causes a problem. So make your ugly cookies go back and make them happy, and they'll all be good. The number two, I'll skip through that, but I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more. Number two is still, believe it or not, SQL injection attacks. And this oh, makes me cry a lot, because it's so simple on what we can do. So let's have a bit of fun. Uh, is my owner my site still running? Come on, Chrome. OK. We will uh, search. Let's try IRL. Oops. Search was IRL. No, that might be the wrong one. And Ireland. Yeah. So it's a very simple search. You'll agree? Nothing crazy. OK. Let's try something else. Uh, this mouse is not having a good day today. Squeeze me. Oh, well played, sir. Well played. It's <laughs> always one second smart ass. Um, <laughs> there we go. OK. What happens here? Do, 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 do. Search. Ooh, what did I find here? <laughs> Sorry, it's telling you what uh, SQL servers are running on my computer. What the hell just happened there? Matrix, that was the glitch in the matrix. You all saw that, right? That no, wasn't just me. <laughs> you are the ones. How to freak out of a presenter, make the screen go black. <laughs> there's, some, there's some guy actually out there with a little zipper going, ping, 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 ping. <laughs> OK. That's a very trivial example of something stupid. Um, let's just bring up SSMS here. Yes. And see where this on screen goes. I have multiple search thingies for this. OK. Um, how am I doing on time? Five minutes. OK, quick, 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 quick. Come on, computer. All 16 gigs of RAM. Let's do it. Uh, dun, dun, dun. I have to find another query. Now, if I was to show you something here, and where am I going to? Here. What does this look like? Anyone? Straight login screen. ASP.NET forms off. Kind of standard issue login wizard. Yeah. OK. Right. What could you imagine then they've done? They've run. And dun, dun, dun. Let's see, we're going to the search again. And if I do the following, 
Union. This is what's known as a union query. And I'm hoping this one works. Whoops, I forgot to do something there. That's how I would find out if it was actually something wrong. And I need to do at the end a nice comment. Ooh. <laughs> okay. So now I've just told I've just queried the database to find out what tables are running in there. Okay? As you can see, ASP.NET applications, membership paths. So I know they're using the ASP.NET membership provider now. So far, so good. What is do we know about the ASP.NET membership provider? It's table schema. So if I do a nice big another query here. Na, 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 na. OK. And we go back over here. Control A, dot, Eugen. Search. We can now see the users and their passwords. <laughs> now, for those of you kind of wondering, well, what good is this? They're all encrypted. In this case, they are actually encrypted and not actually hashed. We will bounce up another piece of code. But first, to prove that everything is actually above board, stop doing that. That freaks me out. Project, we'll just do the ASP.NET configuration. OK, security, create a user, username, go to password. Someone shout a letter. A. Not a letter. B. I can see which way this is going. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Hang on a second. This might get complicated. <laughs> a, B. Two more letters. K, Q. There's always one picks Q. And we'll just do that. It's, I know it's a four character thing. It's not, it's rather not easy to guess, but it's. I will say go to at Hotmail because you know Hotmail is spam. Hotmail.com. OK. Create user. So user has been created. We'll go back here. We'll F5 this. Confirm resubmission. Yes, please. Continue. So go to is sitting there with his nice password. And because we've already downloaded the machine key of this machine, and we will try and bring up this. Nice piece of code. I find that. And this brings up a nice, come on. Oh, yeah, it's in front of me here. We are going to go back to here and try and copy this with my dodgy mouse. Stop using the keyboard. Why you shouldn't encrypt your passwords. Normally, I get a round of applause for doing this. The stunned silence was good, too, though. Thanks. <laughs> There's probably someone going, shit. Can you swear? In that? No, yeah, you can do that in Denmark, because they don't speak English here, so it's all right. Uh, that's one of the first things that got me in, Nor in Norway when I moved up, that uh, there was swearing at like very early on in the day. Anyway, that's our demo done. Number one, the number one reason we're stupid, OK? We make mistakes. Stop making mistakes. Stop being stupid. The problem is we forget stuff. We don't do it right. We'll just make mistakes. It'll leave you so frustrated by what it'll cause, the problems it'll cause. It'll cost you money. It'll cost you a hell of a lot of problems. It may even cost you your job. So there's an ASP.NET resources. Uh, the OWASP 10 by Troy Hunt is free. Go please download it. And thanks to him for uh, rejecting to do this talk. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, Troy. Um, some basic security principles, uh, safe web and all that. These are all going to be on my blog afterwards. Security guidelines, watch out for URL scan. It could get a bit hard. Um, it can harden it too much for you. Uh, image credits, this could take a while. If you are want to contact me, come back screen. Yeah. You can get me on any of this or even catch me afterwards. I am running for a flight after this, so it's got to run. Um, questions? One question. How do you get your hair so red? Um, <coughs> <laughs> I love it. Fuck Kerberos. I miss Landman. Love. Stop it. Uh, can I use two correction strings with an ORM? Very good question. Some you can, some you can't. That's the basic thing I can give you. 
How would you design an ORM layer with multiple connection strings? Same thing. What books to read? Go read Barry Doran's um, Beginning ASP.NET Security and Troy Hunt's OWASP Top 10. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.